buzzed and bustled around him. Some of these people had known him for years. Some knew him in passing. Others merely wanted to meet him. Out of courtesy, I introduced myself. He sort of dipped his head and said, as if he were trying to remember me, that night he threw the winning touchdown while I was sitting on the bench, lacing up my cleats 48 years ago. Valentine. The photographer arranged us in various poses and snapped off a few shots. I was grateful for the distraction. I was aware that the seconds continued to pass, but one form of idle stimulation had supplanted another and modified the unpleasant passage of time. I also reminded myself that in the scheme of things, if I read well or succeeded tonight or didn't, it wouldn't make much difference. The night would shimmer away under the weight of a thousand others. And one day, if I was lucky, I would be an old man in a room with a memory of one great night with the stars. Two minutes, someone said, and a few people swung their heads around at me. I smiled at them and scraped all my stuff together and checked my bookmarks. I felt tall and dry and green like a bamboo plant with bamboo joints. I was led away. I heard the thunder of applause. The MC shuffled it out, did his shtick, and extended an arm. Keep it slow, I thought, shuffling out into the blazing lights and the polite applause of the audience. I couldn't see a thing out there, not even the faint glimmer of jewelry. It was darker than the storage room where I had slept and where I would get sick after drinking too much Pinot Noir, after cooking enchiladas for Russell Banks, because I couldn't find the damn doorknob. It was perfect. I drew myself up to the podium. You could just look out into that blackness and pretend you were seeing faces, acknowledging intellects, sympathizing with hospital workers, cooks, and struggling writers. I cut my introduction in half and leaped straight into the chapter from God Clobbers Us All about an 18-year-old acid head surf bum who has to help an aide on her first day clean up a neglected corpse. I knew the tempo to keep it under 15 minutes, unlike this piece, apparently. <laughs> Especially with a truncated intro and a few parts snipped out here and there, I looked up frequently as I read, corner to corner, front to back, unlike this piece, apparently. <laughs> I know this is important from watching people read. Be confident, be natural, be funny, look up. Why bore them? Be like good Chinese food and give them something to take home. To my surprise, they laughed. In smaller groups, sometimes people are unsure of whether it's appropriate to laugh or not. So a very funny piece might be met as if you were speaking a foreign language. In front of a small group, you don't even really know about your material. But behind the armor of their comrades, lost in the safety of the herd, they can cut loose. And they hadn't come to be lectured to. They hadn't come for leftover turkey. They came to be entertained. They actually left their televisions, their bars, and their DVD players. This is the terrible new reality, the responsibility the modern writer must now face. And quote writing well, unquote, even if it's about, if it's about Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan's hemorrhoids isn't enough. They laughed so hard I had to stop reading at points, still shivering through every dendrite and anxious to come to the end. Afterward, Mr. Scott and I signed a few books out in the lobby. People approached me with a weird sparkle in their eyes to congratulate me. Outside, the stars seemed strangely bright. Women were all over Scott. He was even signing books outside. Finally, we broke away and sneaked back down into the audience to hear Irving. He was an excellent reader, fluid and relaxed, looking up often, holding his audience, making them laugh. Suddenly he seemed like a wonderful guy. I realized he had worked hard to get where he was. It was difficult to imagine how I had ever plotted to drop him. As I settled back into the submissive brainlessness of contentment, I longed vaguely for my earlier vigor to be restored. What was I now but another minion, another hanger-on? The slightest success had robbed me of my fire. It hadn't taken much. Later in the week, as Norman Mailer's limo pulled up to the curb, I felt nothing as the harmless old mastodon stepped out into the rain. Even if my hours were numbered, my glittering days soon to be forgotten, the people of my small town waiting eagerly for me to return home and cook them some supper. Thank you. I'm sorry that was... Thank you. Uh, that was too long. I apologize for the length.
Cheryl Strayed is the author of the memoir Wild, the novel Torch, and Tiny Beautiful Things, a collection of the Dear Sugar columns she writes for The Rumpus, which will be published in July. Her essays have appeared in, among other places, the New York Times Magazine, the Washington Post Magazine, and Best American Essays. Cheryl. Thanks so much for coming, I, especially all you poor people who are standing, and then the other poor people who are sitting behind the standing people. I just, you know, I can't even really, um, I can only speak for myself, but I have a, I, I, I'm going to guess that I'm really speaking for all writers, that what an honor it is that you would come out and listen to us read. So thank you all for being here. And thanks to The Sun Magazine for not only having me here with them tonight, but um, really being so important in my in my writing life, um, first as a reader and being so inspired by the, the kind of work they publish, which I really think is kind of writing from a place of necessity. Let's give a, a round to the sun. I think in a lot of ways, you know, the, the thing that taught me how to write the most is the, is, the, is the writers who I read. And many of those writers have appeared in the Sun magazine. And when I was a graduate student, I sent um, the second essay I ever, I ever wrote. It's called The Love of My Life. I sent it to the Sun, and they took it. And that was really the beginning of my relationship with this magazine. And so a couple years ago, uh, when I started to write this advice column for the rumpus um, called Dear Sugar. Some of, I don't know if some of you are not familiar with it, but some are. Um, and it was this anonymous column. I wasn't telling, you know, it was a secret that I was sugar. Um, and I can't remember when I sort of came out to the, the sun people, but I started to write these these advice columns, and I, I didn't really know what I was going to do when I began. Um, but soon I realized I turned them into more than the, the sort of basic advice. I, I really was turning them into very searching uh, literary essays. And um, I soon realized that they were, they, they felt to me like they belonged in the Sun magazine. They were being published only online at the rumpus net, And um, so I, I just gathered a few of them and sent them to Andrew Snee, here, who's here. And um, I said, I think you guys, I know you don't usually you know publish things that have already been on, online. But they read them, and they were kind enough um, to publish some last year, last summer. And they were the first, and I guess the only time, that these um, these columns have appeared in print. Um, and so I'm going to read one to you. It's called Tiny Beautiful Things. It's the title column from the, the collection that's going to be out in July. And I wrote it, um, a lot of you are here at the AWP conference, which is a writer's conference here in Chicago. And um, I actually wrote Tiny Beautiful Things at AWP last year, um, which was in DC. And on the, the sort of last day of the conference, I, I got what I call the, the great um, plague of AWP of last year. I was so ill. I had like a 102 fever. I couldn't leave my room. Um, and what I did is I just slowly wrote this column, one paragraph at a time, in the midst of my fever. So I, I often say I wrote something in a fever, but this one I wrote in a literal fever. And for those of you who don't know, Dear Sugar, people uh, send uh, emails to me asking me for advice. And um, they're usually people, they're, I don't see their email address, so I don't know who they are. And um, It's an entirely anonymous experience. And just a couple weeks ago on Valentine's Day, I revealed my identity, which is why I'm able to be here tonight and read this. Dear Sugar, I read your column religiously. I'm 22. From what I can tell by your writing, you're in your early 40s. My question is short and sweet. What would you tell your 20-something self if you could talk to her now? Love, Seeking Wisdom. Can you all hear me? Yes. Dear Seeking Wisdom, stop worrying about whether you're fat. You're not fat. Or rather, you're sometimes a little bit fat, but who gives a shit? <laughs> there is nothing more boring and fruitless than a woman lamenting the fact that her stomach is round. Feed yourself. Literally. The sort of people worthy of your love will love you more for this, sweet pea. In the middle of the night, in the middle of your 20s, when your best woman friend crawls naked into your bed, straddles you, and says, you should run away from me before I devour you. Believe her. <laughs> you are not a terrible person for wanting to break up with someone you love. You don't need a reason to leave. 
Wanting to leave is enough. Leaving doesn't mean you're incapable of real love or that you'll never love anyone else again. It doesn't mean you're morally bankrupt or psychologically demented or a nymphomaniac. It means you wish to change the terms of one particular relationship. That's all. Be brave enough to break your own heart. When that really sweet but fucked up gay couple invites you over to their cool apartment to do ecstasy with them, say no. <laughs> there are some things you can't understand yet. Your life will be a great and continuous unfolding. It's good you've worked hard to resolve childhood issues while you're in your 20s, but understand that you will, what you resolve will need to be resolved again and again. You will come to know things that can only be known with the wisdom of age and the grace of years. Most of those things will have to do with forgiveness. One evening, you will be rolling around on the wooden floor of your apartment with a man who will tell you that he doesn't have a condom. You will smile in this spunky way that you think is hot and tell him to fuck you anyway. This will be a mistake. <laughs> for which you alone will pay. Don't lament so much about how your career is going to turn out. You don't have a career. You have a life. Do the work. Keep the faith. Be true blue. You're a writer because you write. Keep writing and quit your bitching. Your book has a birthday. You don't know what it is yet. You cannot convince people to love you. This is an absolute rule. No one will ever give you love because you want him or her to give it. Real love moves freely in both directions. Don't waste your time on anything else. Most things will be okay eventually, but not everything will be. Sometimes you'll put up a good fight and lose. Sometimes you'll hold on really hard and realize there is no choice but to let it go. Acceptance is a small, quiet room. One hot afternoon during the era in which you've gotten yourself ridiculously tangled up with heroin. You will be riding the bus and thinking what a worthless piece of shit you are when a little girl will get on the bus holding the strings of two purple balloons. She'll offer you one of the balloons, but you won't take it because you believe you no longer have a right to such tiny, beautiful things. You're wrong. You do. Your assumptions about the lives of others are in direct relation to your naive pomposity. Many people you believe to be rich are not rich. Many people you think have it easy worked hard for what they got. Many people who seem to be gliding right along have suffered and are suffering. Many people who appear to you to be old and stupidly saddled down with kids and cars and houses were once every bit as hip and pompous as you. When you meet a man in the doorway, of a Mexican restaurant who later kisses you while explaining that this kiss doesn't mean anything because much as he likes you, he's not interested in having a relationship with you or anyone right now. Just laugh and kiss him back. Your daughter will have his sense of humor. <laughs> Your son will have his eyes. The useless days will add up to something. The shitty waitressing jobs, the hours writing in your journal, the long meandering walks, the hours reading poetry and story collections and novels and dead people's diaries and wondering about sex and God and whether you should shave under your arms or not. These things are your becoming. One Christmas at the very beginning of your 20s, when your mother gives you a warm coat that she saved for months to buy, don't look at her skeptically after she tells you she thought the coat was perfect for you. Don't hold it up and say, it's longer than you like your coats to be, and it's too puffy and possibly even too warm. Your mother will be dead by spring. That coat will be the last gift she gave you. You will regret the small thing you didn't say for the rest of your life. Say thank you. Sugar. And now, Sia Stefranski.
the founder and editor of The Sun, who brings together that monthly reminder, the platform for the stories and the voices. He's the author of the essay collection Four in the Morning and is working on a collection of his notebook entries to be published sometime in 2012. Zai. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Can you hear me? All right. Molly, tell me when I'm like two or three minutes out. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to read from my upcoming book, if, which will be a book if I ever finish it. These are uh, excerpts from notebooks. I worship alone in the early morning. My coffee is black as the sky outside. There's no rabbi here, no priest. No one is feeding me chicken soup for my soul. Here in the darkness, I won't be confused with a busy editor whose calls are screened, who gives generously to all the right causes, who every month assembles the wisdom of the ages on the last page of his magazine. Here, I remember that so many fools like me have come and gone. We eased out of bed before our wives were up, sat on the floor, talked to God. How skillfully we bargained. How beautiful our words. Let the minutes show that I'm here. That I braved a none too happy childhood. Legal drugs, illegal drugs, organized religion, disorganized religion, toothaches, stomach aches, the occasional headache, plenty of heartache. The death of my father, the death of my mother, the death of my infant son, three marriages, two divorces, and a long and utterly impractical love affair with myself. <laughs> my first cup of coffee must be strong because I want to be strong. This may be demanding too much of coffee. Self-improvement is my drug of choice, more addictive than coffee, more seductive than marijuana. But imagining that I'll be happier once I become a better man is an illusion. When someone I love dies, will it comfort me to remember that I went to the gym three times this week instead of two? When I die, will my daughters be heartened to know I was at my ideal weight? Yes, I drank too much and smoked too much and talked too much. Do my transgressions rise to the level of an impeachable offense? If I'm going to be tried, I want a judge whose hair is wild and whose suit is rumpled, a judge who's occasionally been seen cupping a joint on the courthouse steps. I want a judge who knows how to laugh, a judge who makes mistakes, a judge who knows that people are the sum of their mistakes, a judge who's figured out that what distinguishes us as a species is that since the dawn of history, we've screwed up again and again. It didn't start yesterday when I ate from the wrong tree. I never saw money as a symbol of personal power. Yet now that I have a few extra dollars in my pocket, I like the expansive feeling that comes from spending a little more on a bottle of wine or picking up the tab when I have lunch with a friend. Surely it's not necessary to renounce the material world in order to grow spiritually. Then I remember Gandhi's injunction. Think of the poorest person you have ever seen and ask yourself if your next act will be of any use to him. I say good morning to the homeless man, then feel embarrassed, as if cheerfulness is a luxury. Outside it's cold and dark. Inside my warm, well-lit house, I'm finishing dinner. Being a man who takes so much for granted, I take this for granted too. What blinds me to my great good fortune? Food and shelter, food and shelter, humanity's mantra for millennia, our unceasing prayer. How many of us have wandered homeless and hungry? How many of us are too weak to stand right now? In my mind's eye, I see a man no different than I am, except he's gaunt, starving, no roof over his balding head. I'm here, he's there. 
But because he's not here, he's less real to me than my cats, less real to me than the bills I paid last night. I'm eating. He's hungry. I'm still eating. I've eaten everything on my plate, and I'm reaching for more. The food is so delicious that I just can't stop myself. More. Give me more. How I yearn to be a better man, though I know that's just a different kind of greed. When I fell for Norma, her name went up in giant letters on all the billboards along the road to my heart. I'd get up before dawn to write, then come back to bed a couple of hours later, a wake-up call she couldn't ignore. In the middle of the day, we'd meet at home, for lunch, ostensibly, though we rarely left time to eat. In the evening, we made love before dinner or after dinner or sometimes during dinner, our bodies promising each other with bod what bodies can never quite deliver, but we tried. Last night, my mind wandered. It wasn't Norma I was embracing, but the woman she was 20 years ago. We were burning up the sheets back then, every night a riot in the city, the two of us looting everything that wasn't nailed down. I wondered if the woman in my arms would be jealous. Of course you jerk, said the woman in my head. I'm grumpy because Norma had dinner last night with another man. I'm grumpy because it was dinner, not lunch. I'm grumpy because I shouldn't even care. They weren't fucking each other. They were just eating overpriced pasta in a trendy restaurant, just being friends. I'm grumpy because after nearly 18 years of marriage, this is old, this is 10 years ago, I'm still so easily threatened by another man, even when the threat isn't real. My wife loves me dearly. She'd never betray me. Then why do I respond to every blip on the radar screen as if it signaled an attack? When it comes to marriage, I'm just like President Bush, insisting we need a $500 billion missile defense shield to protect us while we sleep. 